I want to welcome everybody. Uh, I am Bruce Kane, the director of the Bill Lane Center for the American West. And uh, this is another in our series on Western communities, Western writers, Western topics. Uh, today, we're very pleased to have uh, Nick Neely, who is a writer and a journalist and actually a teacher, too. Um, he grew up in Port Tola Valley, so he's uh, local to us, uh, at least he was. Uh, but now he, re he resides in uh, Haley, Utah. He uh, has a, a master's in literature in the environment from uh, University of Nevada, Reno. He's got MFAs in nonfiction and poetry from Columbia and Hunter College. Seems like a, a, an odd place to go for somebody who's interested in nature, but he, I'm sure will explain that to us. Um, his first book was called Coast Range, uh, a collection uh, from the Pacific Edge that came out in 2016 uh, and was a finalist for a couple prizes. And then his second book, uh, Alta California, is the one we're going to focus on. It's Alta Cal California from San Diego to San Francisco, a journey on foot to rediscover the golden state. Uh, this, uh, in addition to writing these two books, he's also uh, written for Mother Jones, Kenyon Review, Southern Review. I mean, there's at least uh, 12 or 15 uh, various journals that he's written for. So he's a very prolific writer. Uh, in addition, he's been a visiting lecturer at the University of California, Santa Barbara in the Writing and Literature Program. And then I read online, I assume this is true, that you're the assistant professor in the fall, or is that right? Or have you started already uh, at uh, Eastern right. Oregon University's MFA program? So That's not right. only do, does he write a lot, but he teaches people how to write. So. But uh, this book is a really fascinating book and an unusual book. It, it chronicles a journey, a 12-week journey that starts in the southern part of the state and uh, tries to follow the path, although it can't do it 100% these days, and he'll tell you why, <laughs> of the 1769 Spanish expedition uh, into California. And today, to uh, upgrade our format, we have brought in uh, my colleague Felicity Berenger. Uh, many of you may know her. She is a, a prominent journalist who's written for the Washington Post. She was a journalist for the Post. She was a journalist for the New York Times. Uh, she has been at the Lane Center now, what, Felicity, about five or six years, maybe? No, or maybe four, more like four. Four, four years, oh, okay. Uh, she does I'm so much. I'm when you're having fun. Well, just, uh, she's been so productive, it seems like she's been here forever. But uh, she runs a, a blog that we're very proud of called And the West. So uh, what we will do today is that we were going to ask Nick to make a few reflections on this book. It came out about a year ago, so I think a little bit. Um, about the book in retrospect, uh, obviously tell us a little bit more about what's in it. Um, and then Felicity's gonna take over with the Q&A this week. Uh, and then I will field the questions that come in through the uh, question and answer and the chat function. And we will finish up in an hour as usual. So Nick, tell us a little bit about the book. Thanks so much, Bruce. And thanks to everyone who's joined us for this session. Here's the book. Uh, and hardback came out in November, so it's six months old. And actually, today is the release of the paperback. So it's fun to celebrate um, with everyone. Um, uh, a little bit about how this book came to be. Um, in the writing of my first book, which was mentioned, Coast Range, um, I that's a book of, of natural history essays in um, sort of various forms. Uh, that's set in Southern Oregon and in the Bay Area where I grew up. Bruce mentioned I grew up in Portola Valley. And um, I was writing an, an essay about madrone trees, which many of you may know of. They're a beautiful tree that are found in the, uh, along the coast in the Bay Area. And um, I learned that the madrone had been given its name by the lead or the main chronicler of the, of the Portola expedition, also known as the Sacred Expedition. His name was Padre Juan Crespi. And um, he, he called it the Madronio because it looked like a similar species that he knew of in Spain. And when I, when I came across that fact in my research, it was kind of a, a minor explosion in my brain because I wondered why I had, you know, knew, never, first of all, never incurred, encountered his extensive journals before, though I grew up in Portola Valley, named after the, the captain who led this expedition. And... Um, uh, and it, it made me think, you know, what else had this expedition given name to? What was their experience like 
traveling up the coast in 1769, um, which is when they made this excursion, the first overland Spanish expedition to California. And um, I, it seemed like, uh, and I, I was looking for another writing project, it seemed like an amazing opportunity to um, do something new and accomplish uh, a couple of different things I had wanted really to do. Um, I, you know, I consider myself an environmental writer and there's, of course, the allure of a long walk. There's some very notable examples out there such as Cheryl Strait's Wild and Bill Bryson's um, A Walk in the Woods, one, you know, the former set on the Pacific Crest Trail and the latter on the Appalachian Trail. And it's hard to, in the post strayed Bryson world to know how to do that kind of project and do something new. Um, and when I, the more I thought about the Bertol expedition, I realized it would take me um, through a really varied uh, set of environments, you know, through downtown LA, through some of our, our you know, biggest suburbs in California, um, through farmland agricultural valleys like the Salinas and the Santa Maria Valley, um, through even uh, uh, true, you know, designated wilderness areas in Big Sur. And um, so it seemed the perfect setup to do a, a kind of environmental writing that I had been really wanting to do since uh, my days in college. Uh, and um, this relates to, Bruce mentioned why, you know, why would environmental writer end up in New York City? And that's a little bit by, by coincidence. My wife, actually, my now wife took us there. Um, she was doing a painting program. And so I decided to get my MFAs there. But it was really uh, um, informative and sort of influential experience for me because for a long time there's been a dearth of environmental writing about our urban settings and they've been kind of passed over by by nature writers um, for, for places that are you know look more like what we think of as as wilderness so from a very you know since my early 20s or even earlier um, I had had in mind a project that would sort of take on urban and suburban environmental writing. And so this presented itself as the perfect um, sort of project for that. And I think in many ways it was, it took me through such an array of environments. Um, um, let's see, I think, um, so just to give you a little bit more background about the expedition, um, they, this, their walk, and they also had about 50 mules and as many horses, so uh, many of them were riding. Um, occurred in 1769. Uh, this was, as I mentioned, the first incursion European overland expedition in, in what's now California. Um, there were missions established in, in Baja, California, and so they actually sort of staged there and then came up to San Diego where they regrouped um, and a smaller, a uh, group of Spaniards led by Gaspar de Pertola um, went north from there. Um, and they were motivated by a couple things. One was there was a rumor that uh, Russian fur traders were, were sort of trickling down the coast. So it was sort of a race to claim the territory. Um, and also a hundred and uh, more than 150 years previous, uh, the, the sea uh, explorers this, you know, had glowingly reported the existence of uh, the port of Monterey. Um, and this had become sort of legendary. It hadn't been verified. And they, they had in mind uh, Monterey as kind of uh, the perfect place for trade ships coming back from the Philippines to uh, rest and resupply before heading back south to New Spain, what's, what's now um, Mexico. And then, of course, the, you know, maybe the third motivation is to uh, convert the native populations of California. So they were also scouting um, mission sites, uh, mission sites the whole way. And Juan Crespi, there were two Franciscan Padres uh, along with this group of about 63 men. And um, Juan Crespi was tasked specifically with sort of recording, keeping an eye out for what would be uh, ideal uh, mission sites that had good water, um, good soil for agriculture, good water sources, good soil, and finally substantial native populations um, so that these missions could bring those, those uh, indigenes into their orbit and convert them to Catholicism. 
And um, that, that leads me to, you know, sort of one of my major takeaways um, from this project, which is um, the extent to which our concerns in California really remain those of this first expedition, water, soil, um, population growth. Um, they were tracking the same sort of things that we now struggle with at a much greater scale. You know, they had to be careful to move from water source to water source. They were sending a scouting party out in advance of the whole expedition, uh, moving to, so that they would end up at a lake or a, or a, or a creek or a river um, night by night. Um, you know, some of the uh, agricultural valleys that they went down are now the biggest in California. Um, the Santa Clara River Valley, which is full of uh, orange gro citrus groves, especially in bell pe peppers in Ventura County. The Salinas Valley, the, which is considered by many, you know, or it has called itself the bread basket of the world. Um, and then the Santa Maria Valley, of course, in San Luis Obispo County, um, which is, uh, you know, an astoundingly productive fertile area. Um, and so it was, you know, amazing to think about their concerns in light of, of ours and also to see the ways in which we have, you know, dramatically altered, of, of course, not unexpectedly, um, the places, the very places where they camped um, and visited. And I was continuously surprised the extent to which, especially in Southern California, we have, you know, filled in concretized, drained, uh, otherwise modified um, the areas through which the Bertola expedition passed. Uh, just to give you a couple examples, I, I've been teaching, uh, I was teaching until the virus um, arrived, I was down in Santa Barbara teaching on campus at UCSB and each time, each day I go to campus, I drive by the Goleta uh, Slough, which um, was when the Patola expedition passed through one of the centers of the Chumash world. There were uh, several thousand people living around uh, a lagoon there. And now um, there were so many people there that uh, the, the expedition actually could get no rest. And ultimately um, the Spanish decided there were too many people there to even site a presidio and mission. So they put it in Santa Barbara a little further away so as not to potentially be overwhelmed. Um, but now that lagoon is completely filled in. There's an airport over it. Um, there was an island in the middle of that lagoon that had a village of 500 Chumash and it was bulldozed into the lagoon ultimately for the sake of the airport. And now there's a, there's a little sliver of, of a hill that was once an island. Um, so, you know, dramatic changes like that were, were really eye-opening and poignant um, moving all along the way. Another example in the Santa Maria Valley, that one of the agricultural valleys I mentioned, I came to uh, a place called Guadalupe Lake, where I thought it was going to be a lake. The Portola Expedition described it as almost a mile long and having, you know, abundant wi uh, wild or waterfowl on it. And I, I arrived there, I went down, I went through sort of a eucalyptus grove, because of course eucalyptus being one of our standout invasive species. And there was the lake and at its bottom were, were um, rows of you know, The lake had been drained, you could still see these immense sort of verses. And down at the base was, water was being piped in where once there was water. And of course that, that lake no longer exists for a number of reasons, you know, climate change being one of them, but also um, the groundwater extraction has carried that water, you know, elsewhere throughout the valley so that crops could grow. And so water now has to be piped in where there was once a lake. And so there were just sort of really moving um, moments like that where I, where I, you know, could just see how land had changed and how um, maybe our values and of course our populations had changed alongside it. Um, and I, you know, this, this uh, book ultimately ends up in California, or in, uh, sorry, in the Bay Area, as many of you may know. The Portola Expedition was the first to glimpse the, what's now the San Francisco Bay. They came over the crest of the coast range of the Santa Cruz Mountains on November 4th, 1769, so 250 years ago. And part of the impetus for getting the book out and doing the project when I did it was to to sort of honor the anniversary. Um, 
but they marched down to uh, uh, down through the San Andreas Valley towards Stanford, um, and I, I following their path, walked down Sand Hill Road ultimately uh, to Palo Alto. And I just thought I'd finish my my little intro here by reading a couple of paragraphs from near the end of the book, so you can get a slice of of uh, what I was up to. And I won't, I'll try, I won't, I won't give away too much, I hope. Um, but I thought I'd just give you a little flavor of, of when I was in the uh, San Francisco Creek, uh, very near Stanford. And uh, here, I'll, I'll just read two paragraphs. A yellow rumped warbler landed on the rim of a culvert, this is down in the San Francisco Creek, and drank from its mouth as the cylinder made timp tympanic sounds from the vibrations of cars where a road crossed it, I thought, and carried the faint calls and laughter of children, and even of birds from its other opening, who knows where. Up ahead, I heard a rumble and whistle of a Caltrans train, so I knew I was nearing the park I wanted to find. I climbed out on the convenient ladder of the culverts poured concrete, and as I climbed, I came face to face with two banana slugs on the bank's uh, earth, hermaphrodites together in a mating circle, a yin-yang, all of one slimy cadmium yellow, their heads sweeping back and forth as they caressed and nipped each other. It was three o'clock in the afternoon. A person was sleeping behind a log between the creek and the bike path, half, a, half in a sleeping bag, teepee nearby, old boots, a Macy's men's store across the street in the Stanford Shopping Center. I had surfaced to the final hundred yards of Sand Hill Road, and a minute later I was standing at the intersection of Sand Hill and El Camino, the Royal Road of the Missions. Walk, 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 said the crossing sign. So I did, over El Camino to a short diagonal spur of Palo Alto Avenue, which quickly became Alma Street, just blocks from downtown. Alma means soul in Spanish. The railroad crossing started to flash and ring like the bells in a church tower swinging in the sun, and the bar came down between me and the tracks as the engine left the station an eighth of a mile off. Purple and silver, the commuter rail, Caltrans, accelerated with its passengers seated in both directions. Through the tinted windows, some were watching the landscape proceed like time itself as they sped toward San Francisco. When the bars raised, I stepped across the tracks turned left on a bike path and found myself below an ancient but unassuming redwood tree. You can walk right up to it. Those are near, near those are pages are very near the end of the book, um, ends up in Palo Alto, um, my old stomping grounds. And um, I think that gives you a flavor of sort of the ways in which I was trying to combine in this book, environmental natural history writing as we might think of it in, the tradition of, say, Thoreau, um, but also do something new and really bring in our built environment into the text and also to complement that um, a lot of our human history, which was, which was sort of how I saw myself uh, expanding myself as a writer in this book, really challenging myself to radically combine human and natural history. And so I think I'll stop there and see what Felicity has for me. Well, I will say what I uh, said uh, uh, just before we went live, which is uh, this is just an incredibly impressive book. And I'm a big fan of John McPhee and Peter Matheson and, uh, and Annie Dilliard and, uh, of course, did Thoreau back when we all did Thoreau. Right. Uh, and this is a new take on, uh, on the kind of work they've done. And, I, I was very impressed. Thank but, you. And, and I, I should say, you know, the, all those people you've mentioned have, have been influenced, have been influences on me. And I've sort of seen myself as in conversation for, with them and trying to advance their work, you know, in this, in this more integrated direction. No, that's, the, it was very impressive. One thing just about how you planned it out. Did you, before you ever flew to San Diego, did you have a sort of map in your mind really detailed of what you were going to do every day and whether you could walk 16 miles a day or 18 miles a day and, and where you'd stay? Or did you improvise? 
I, you know, I'm not much of a planner, to be honest, but this was such an undertaking that I did try. I thought it, I was, I really should, you know, do a little planning beforehand. So I, I kind of, I had a, a Google map or the like, and I sort of mapped out um, the initial uh, legs. And it really, really was only through San Diego County. And then I kind of lost steam. And I was just sort of tracking as best I could where they had camped night by night so I could I could have my targets for each day. And they, they weren't going um, extraordinary distances because they were a big group, a lot of animals, and they were also sending, as I mentioned, that, that scouting party out in advance. So I, I estimate they're going about eight to 10 miles a day, sometimes more. And sometimes I, I got a little out of sync with them and I'd have to you know do a longer day to catch up um that sort of thing but um no i didn't really you know i i, I didn't really want to over plan um i wanted what i encountered to be really organic and serendipitous um i uh you know i did things like kind of on a whim like going to uh legoland in san diego county for instance which i i knew it was there but i didn't know whether i would whether i would do it or it would be within striking distance um and uh, then eventually all that planning just fell away. And I was, my, my routine was I would read the journals um, uh, the night before, you know, sort of in, in my tent or in the morning before leaving. So that I would have in mind the kinds of things to look out for, you know, things um, that would resonate with the, with the diaries. There were three diaries kept on expedition, um, Padre Juan Crespi's being the most robust. Um, so that was mainly what I'm in conversation with in the book. Um, but uh, yeah, I just, I would, and then of course, scholars have uh, in, the, in the authoritative translation of Crespi's journal, um, uh, Alan K. Brown, who did that translation, has, has uh, nicely identified where they landed. Um, and you can kind of, reading the descriptions, you can more or less, um, you know, figure that out on your own. So I was triangulating between these journals and uh, going for those the places where you know where they camped. I did my best to be loyal to their camp spots. I don't know if that answers your question, but no, that that, that does that does. One one of the things that uh, I'm curious about when there was serendipitous things like Legoland, for instance, or uh, you know the uh, further up the trail, the interview with a taxidermist or an uh -huh. those those guys who were hanging out on the tracks. Um, some of those uh, in, interactions took a lot more time than you thought, and then you'd have to catch up. Mm -hmm. How do you, obviously you're deciding on the fly. How do you decide what's interesting culturally, or in terms of natural history, or just in terms of an experience? Um, how did you make that decision on the fly? Well, yeah, I mean it's it's really interesting. You know, the hardest part about the journey wasn't the distances that I was covering, which were modest by any through hiking standard. You know, on the Pacific Crest Trail, you do 20 or maybe even 25 miles a day, depending on how ambitious you were. I was doing eight to 10 um, on average, but I was spending all day long on my feet. I had what I like to, like to call museum legs. You know, the landscape became a kind of museum and I was always looking for things that had resonance, for, that had heat, that might be a moment that would fold into the book. Um, and it actually, you know, early on, it was harder for me to determine what, what might be included. Later, as material of material had been built, I would say, oh, this might connect, you know, in my mind, even if subconsciously, this might connect with what happened, you know, three weeks ago. Uh, even if I don't mention it explicitly in the book, you know, the, uh, a certain reader will be able to see how that builds from one to the next. Um, and then, you know, you're always making a kind of cost benefit calculus as a, a, a travel writer say, you know, is this conversation fruitful? Um, you know, how, or even how is this little mini writing session going? And is it flowing? If it's not, maybe it's just time to, to move on. And um, I would do things like uh, just kind of along the way or the night before read micro histories on my phone about places I was going um, which would kind of give me, a, you know, maybe I'd have a lead, maybe that would end up visiting somewhere that I might not have visited or had any knowledge about otherwise. Um, yeah, there was a fascinating, I, it, this, this may be part of what you're talking about, when uh, you were in northern San Diego County and there was the mission of uh, San Luis Rey, 
Mm -hmm. And the people, I think, were called Luisenos, mm -hmm. the, the indigenous uh, people. Right. And one of them, at the age of 12 or 13, had been sent to Spain or to Italy, even, uh, as it reminded me of uh, the, the, the a uh, young native who was taken to England and shown off for for the queen uh, back. Yeah. But it, it seemed, but he had written something. You could talk about what you were seeing through his eyes as a child, but you said he'd been totally um, bamboozled by the propaganda of uh, the Catholic Church, and therefore everything he said was was praising the arrival of uh, the Portola expedition. How did you find out? That, that that was out there. Was that something you knew before you went to San Luis Rey? Did you find it out afterwards? Um, you're, so you're referencing a, a Luisenio boy named uh, Pablo Pac, Pac yeah. uh, who, who wrote, you know, one of the earliest, um, you know, insider accounts uh, or memoirs about uh, mission life. Um, he wrote that in Spain and he also wrote a sort of partial dictionary uh, uh, of, of the Luisano language. Um, and, um, I, you know, I, I, I can't remember now if I knew of him. I, I'm sure I encountered his name when I visited the mission. I, whenever possible, I tried to visit the missions along the way. You know, I figured uh, 1769 was a great point in time to write about because I could write about the mission history that followed and was so devastating to the Native populations, and then write about Native culture and, and that history on the other side of that. Um, so I, you know, no, the bulk of those sort of connections I made, you know, when I read his journals more in depth um, in the writing of the book afterwards, as I was looking to kind of weave it all together. Um, but you know, he did things like he mentioned um, them killing a or a, treeing a, a mountain lion in one of the mission orchards and um, you know, killing it with stones. Um, and I was thinking about mountain lions. I had my own mountain lion encounter in the book. And those sorts of things, I think, kind of just sort of tendril together over the course of, of the book. And that's, that's really sort of my, my interest uh, as a literary writer, I think, is to create those sort of tentative and tendril-like connections. And that the, hopefully the books, the associations sort of build as you go. You, you, you definitely anticipated my next question, which was, as one reads it, you're, the, the reader is seeing through different eyes. It's seeing through native eyes, as mm -hmm. the stories of, of Tak, definitely seeing through uh, Father Crespi's eyes and, and Portola's and, and the mm -hmm. Spanish missionaries, seeing through the eyes of the people you encounter whether it's a guide at a, uh, you know, the, the guy who gets you through the fort uh, or a guide on a, uh, an open space reserve. Um, and then your eyes. And I'd add just one thing about, they see it through your eyes, but in a way I'd never seen before. You quote the diaries, you quote the Luis Seno boy, and you quote yourself. So you were writing at the end of the day and you were, uh -huh. you're, this is, I, I take it. And I would find these things that started with quotations and I'm going, who the hell is he quoting? But you're quoting yourself. Tell me about the different perspectives that you wanted to provide and how you felt they connected and why you quoted yourself. That's a great question. I mean, no one's really asked me that so directly so far. So I'm glad to, glad to feel that question. No, I, I really, Give, you know, uh, an outstanding work of history includes a variety of voices, a chorus of voices, and that, um, you know, I didn't, I, I made a decision I, not to set up appointments as a, you know, as another reporter might have done, because I wanted my experience to have the feel of a real expedition where there was just sort of, you don't know what you're going to encounter or what conversations you're going to find. So I, uh, you know, I brought in historical testimony um, to as a you know instead um, to so that the native Californians would have their voice and be able to tell their side um, you know uh, tell the truth about the California missions um, and and then in terms of quoting myself uh, you know uh, one thing I was thinking about is first of all the creation of a book and I wanted to I wanted to show the reader sort of the raw material um, and um, I first sort of bring that in maybe a third of the way in. Uh, and I kind of think of it as like a, a little gear shift that 
helps keep a reader's eyes eyes open. What is a really quite a long book, um, and then and then you can start to think about the difference between the way I'm, I'm sculpting certain passages, and then you get glimpses of of the raw material, um, which is similar and but also much more off the cuff. And um, and then the you know the other sort of I guess the deeper point is that. Um, uh, it's just sort of the arbitrariness or the limits of any any single you know testimony, my own included. I'm fashioning a history here too, and it's just simply me speaking into a recorder. Um, so I just wanted the reader to be thinking, you know, sort of at that level, um, you, you know, the, what goes into the making of a narrative um, and, and into our histories. So just to, to follow up on that idea, if you are showing all these different voices, including your own, and there's something eternal in the landscape, let's say the ocean, mm. what was over the, and, and the answer may have changed depending on whether you were in San Diego County or Santa Barbara County or Monterey County or San Mateo, what was the relationship of these different voices to the ocean? How did the Spaniards mm. feel about it? How did the Ohlone feel about it or the Chumash? How did you feel about it? And how has culture developed along it and changed? The ocean particularly, because this was all an ocean trip. Yeah, it was, it was for the most part all along the ocean. I, you know, I did make a few jags inland where the, the expedition confronted seaside mountains like uh, in Santa Monica and in Big Sur. They just couldn't get their mule trains along those rugged coasts before there were roads. So they went inland. Um, in any case, yeah, the ocean, you know, you know, I, I, I could think of the ocean as like the one thing here that might look the same. And then I'd, then I'd sort of remind myself, oh, but acidification, oh, but uh, uh, that's ongoing currently. Or, um, you know, the, the, the gyre of, of plastic debris out in the middle or the way, in fact, that the ocean has has fallen since uh, the, the Pertola expedition is now on the rise. Um, so part of the trick was to sort of, um, or one thing I was up to is to try to keep myself mindful of the fact that what looks like it could could be, you know, could be too, you know, preserved as it was 200 years ago is actually quite different. Um, even, you know, some of the hillsides, classic California, that I could imagine looking at them that this is, oh, what the expedition saw, but no, those hills are swept over with European grasses, the vegetation's different. They've been grazed and and, the, and many of the trees have, have been felled too. Um, but we think of that as quintessential California. Um, and, and, you know, another, well, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there, stop there. I did, you know, there is a, I did feel uh, doing this trip that I that I could connect, you know, on some level, but maybe a romantic notion with kind of the eternal California. Um, but I think the book also, you know, tries to push back against that too, even though that that kind of romance is in the book as well. It's hard to avoid, but I, I tried to be self conscious about it or or kind of cut it down as it comes in. Talk a little bit about the naming. Because again, you're going through these counties, you're going through past lots of places. The names are known to everybody listening here. Um, but some of the name, the, the sources of the names are obvious. The missions, Santa Barbara, San Luis Rey, but uh, yeah. San Diego. But some of the names totally came out of the blue, like Pajaro. Uh, talk a little bit about Pajaro, the names that you found surprising, even if you'd known the name all your life, that you found the origin surprising. Can you say which which name are you referencing? Uh, Pajaro, like Pajaro, oh. the, the one that came. Yeah. The, the, the condor that was killed by the right. natives. They burnt their village. Yeah. Pajaro Valley, uh, yeah. uh, you know, Pajaro in Spanish. Um, you, that you know that so there's kind of there's always this push and pull in, in the naming that went on. The the uh, Franciscan padres were laying names on the land um, according to the calendar of saints. So whatever the day it was, or they arrived somewhere, uh, they would uh, name the place accordingly. And interestingly, like some of those names traveled north or south ultimately, so that the, you know, the original um, San Juan Capistrano or whatever it might be is was actually, you know, according to Crespi, two two valleys to the south uh, or whatever. 
Um, but then there was, there's the, the soldiers were also uh, giving name to the land and, and Crespi would occasionally um, mention those names in his, his journal. So when they came to the, the Pajaro River uh, near, near Watsonville in Northern California, um, there they encountered, the scouts had, had found a, a robust village there um, that was really didn't, hadn't heard word that they were coming and were very unnerved. And so they, they tried to, you know, uh, communicate with them and placate them a little bit. And then when the whole expedition arrived the next day, they found that those villages had been abandoned and burned. But what was left there was a pole with a large black bird, which may have been a condor or may have been an eagle. But in any case, it had been stuffed with grass and hung at the top of this pole as a kind of, you know, uh, as a, a symbol that we still don't really know how to interpret. But Thus, the, the, um, the, how that, that river and valley got its name. The, the soldier's name went out in that case versus the ceremonial Catholic name. Um, and yeah, I mean, even Los Angeles, Los Angeles um, was named, they arrived there on um, sort of the, the feast day. Uh, and so Los Angeles was given its name that very same way. It was a much longer name. It was, uh, Nuestra Senora uh, de Los Angeles de Porciuncula, which we have abbreviated to LA. Um, so yeah, names are always a contentious thing and they're, they're shifting even now. And um, I, I sort of, in the book, I, I sort of float the idea of seismic activity that names are still sort of trembling uh, across California. That's cool. You talk to an awful lot of people and I, I haven't gotten to every part, so I don't know who all you talked to, but the, the ones that uh, stood out to me, there was um, the uh, indigenous people who were running from Alaska to Ter Tierra del Fuego, the Peace and Dignity Walker mm -hmm. run. Uh, there was a taxidermist uh, that, uh, and you were clearly not terribly comfortable going in, in there. How did you decide who to have longer conversations with and how did they decide to talk to you? That's a, that's a good question. I, I think um, I was, I guess I was drawn to sort of the outsider figure, the figure that would sort of give a, a less conventional um, or uh, maybe in some ways uh, raw portrait of California. Um, in the case of the taxidermist, that, that was just after I crossed the Pajaro River, the Pajaro River. And, uh, you know, thinking of the, the taxidermy bird that had been on the pole that the exhibition had seen, I knew, you know, right away, like, here is a connection that I can make as a writer and that is actually there. And moreover, uh, I had the whole way past countless roadkill. Um, and I, I knew that uh, the taxidermist would be working with roadkill. And so, um, and it was a, a quick way to sort of take a survey of the, the fauna of California by going in there and seeing what was arrayed on his tables. Um, but, you know, I, I, I think I was, um, just to maybe the quick answer is, um, uh, it was sort of the outsider figure that was more receptive to me too, because I was, you know, I think most, some people could tell that I, I was on, a, I had a project, you know, and I was, I was doing something that was professional, even if it looked like I was a a drifter, but many people couldn't discern that. And so I was intimidating as a tall, tall man who, who uh, unthinkingly or, or stupidly grew out a beard to make himself even less approachable, um, which is something at the time, and I think probably made a difference uh, in, in how I was received. Um, but yeah, I could, I could sort of, you know, it's it, it part of his chance and of course it's in part my my artistic vision of what California is and how I want you know what voices I want to come through those on the periphery are, are the ones that I think we need to hear and why do you think they talk to you um you know everyone uh everyone has stories to tell and if you show genuine interest in them I mean I, I think all reporters know that m most people open up if you spend time with them um, and I, I would, you know, I, I was mainly, I was genuinely interested in the things that they were doing or their stories. And I, I really wanted to also capture their, their, their voice. Um, and I think there's a range, you know, I, I try not to sort of, um, 
wash over uh, the, the range of dialects or ways of speaking that are that people presented me. I try to capture that, and that, that's one of the things I'm proud of doing in the book. I don't know if that answers your question. What, whether it's encounters like that or facts you ran across historical, what surprised you most? About the trip? Or on um, the trip. Yeah. Say again? On the trip. On the trip. I mean, I was, I, it's, it's so hard to say. I was just continuously, I was continuously surprised. The whole thing was one, you know, endless surprise that, you know, the, the trick for me was just not to shut down because I was, I was trying to keep my eyes open to the extent where I, you know, I was facing burnout at the end of every day. And there, there would come a time at the end of the day, like I'd, I'd, I'd realized that I had something that was perfect narratively, or, you know, I had a last line for the day. Not all writers think in those terms, but if I knew that there was nothing that I was going to encounter in this day, you know, that was going to outdo this this episode or this moment I just experienced, then I would just book it to my campsite, you know, and and, and log miles as fast as I could. Um, and usually that moment was late in the day. I didn't treat myself to to early ends for the most part. Um, you know, I, I I was I was I guess you know I was surprised. To the extent, you know, we think of, of California as so overrun, damaged, built, but it's remarkably preserved, you know, it's, uh, you know, preserved in its way. Um, and, and I, you know, I think Californians are exceedingly lucky to the extent to which there is open space, um, state parks, even if underfunded, uh, you know, even the, the ranch lands, the giant ranches that are still off limits to the public, those are an amazing resource that hopefully eventually will open up to the public. Um, you know, Talk a little bit about the origin of those ranches because I was fascinated by that. Well, uh, you know, all, all the major uh, ranches uh, were, were sort of loosely outlined by this expedition. Um, and then uh, many of, in fact, uh, many members of the expedition um, were original, you know, had original land grants. Um, so they sort of stayed, some of them stayed, and those ranches uh, were sort of passed down through their families. Um, you mean, and now, give everybody the names of some of the ranches because we'll recognize them. Um, well, let's see, like the Hollister Ranch or the Coho Halama Ranches, um, which are, uh, you know, just uh, to the west of Santa Barbara and is sort of considered where North, Southern California turns to Northern. That's where I start the book sort of mid journey in the prologue. But Coho, you know, the Coho uh, is so named, means crippled. And um, uh, it got its name from the Portola expedition because there they, um, it, well, it's sort of debated, but they had a lame mule, which they left there with the, with the village that was near Point Conception. And also uh, there was a chief there, a, a Chumash chief who uh, was handicapped. Um, and it's sort of debatable, or probably both, you know, at, um, the reason that, that that area got its name, that ranch. Um, I think we should probably uh, let in some of the outside questions and then we can come back. Uh, Felicity, I'm sure yeah. has enough questions to keep you going for three hours, but. We did promise the audience they could get their questions in. So the first one has to do with something you haven't talked as much about, which is the actual story of the expedition, and in particular, the relationship with uh, the you know Native Americans that they ran into. There's a uh, the, so the questioner asks, you know, there's what they learned uh, in the past about this, which was kind of sanitized, versus what we now know to be. A history of brutality in the treatment of uh, many of these tribes. So, uh, when you think about it, do you believe that uh, there that this is something that should be introduced earlier into the curriculum? Is the question that's been raised, and what you learn about the story that you maybe didn't learn when you were in high school? That's a you know a great and complex question. Uh, I I think you know what was eye opening for me is uh, when I was in elementary school, which I guess was in the, in the 90s, um, we did our fourth grade unit on mission history. And also in fourth grade, you study California Native Americans and um, the gold rush. Um, and the, you know, the mission history, you do your mission project, you build your, your little miniature mission model. 
but you're not really, you're not, they're not teaching you about genocide. And, at, and in fourth grade, um, you know, that can be tough to bring in and, uh, and it's, it's maybe a little early to, to tell all the, the horrific details. Um, I don't know, I'm not a child psychologist in that regard, but I didn't get the, you know, I didn't understand the extent to which um, this was a genocide um, that, that occurred and especially occurred um, later, you know, around the gold rush. Um, so, um, and then, and then, so we need to be teaching in fourth grade a little bit more complexly. And then I, in high school, there, I never received a unit um, uh, on California history. And I think that not only was that a disservice because I was a more complex person than uh, I would have been interested in the, in the, you know, it would have been astounded and taken aback to hear about these atrocities and the complexity there. But, um, you know, also it sort of hurt. I didn't connect with history in a way that I might have had I been learning about our local history. Instead, I was, you know, what I remember from high school's Renaissance history, East Coast history. Um, and for, for whatever reason, I don't know if that's still true. I should, I should get to the bottom of that, you know, if California history is taught in a, in a deep and complex way in high school now or what that curriculum looks like. But I agree, we need to, we need to be touching upon these things, not just touching upon them, but diving into them in high school in California. All right, a slightly easier question here, which is uh, how did you um, factor in where to eat, what to eat, and places to sleep on the journey? Yeah, I, I mean, it was a mix. I tried to camp as much as possible and I was, you know, my sort of go-to camping spot was the dry creek bed running, you know, through suburbia in Southern California because it floods every once in a while, you can't build on it. Um, so I would pitch my tent in among the Arundo or the, the willows there and um, then move on. And I tried to make it as close to possible as to where, where the Patola expedition had camped, you know, in some cases, um, you know, probably on the same, you know, bank or, or something like that. Um, and then, but, you know, maybe like once or twice a week, on average, I'd end up in a motel, either because it was safest, like in downtown LA, I decided it wasn't worth the anxiety and the risk to sleep on the sidewalk. Um, so I, you know, stayed in a, a motel or in a hostel there, and every once in a while I need to shower and recharge. So, and I figured that was, that was really sort of part of this modern trekking experience. And same goes for eating. You know, I, I think one of the points I try, I, I often talk about how I'm eating at fast food restaurants in the book. And um, I wanted to embrace that as an environmental writer to just show uh, the extent to which that's the only option in many of these places. You know, I had to go into McDonald's to get water, uh, otherwise, uh, you know, it wasn't available or to use a restroom. Um, and I also think we, we all, you know, in, as environmentalists, if that's what some of us are, we need to sort of own up to our hypocrisies and show that you can be an environmentalist and still, you know, go through the Taco Bell drive through So uh, a couple of, uh, um, the question, there's a question here that also fits with something I was going to ask, so I'll put the two together. Uh, the question is, were you able to visit Martin's Beach? And, uh, you know, and, you know, what does it mean that these, you know, these issues about access, et cetera, and related to that would be in general, were you aware of when you were inside the Coastal Commission zone and when you were outside and did you observe any differences as you went from one zone to the other? Um, and I did, I went past Martin's Beach on Highway 1 and I stepped Know, down towards, I didn't go down to the beach itself in, in, in part uh, for sake of time because it was late in the day, but I do write about that controversy in the book and I try to pull in sort of modern controversies opportunistically and selectively along the whole way. So you're not just, get, it's not just a historical narrative, it's really a snapshot of, of the sort of contemporary issues in California. But it's just interesting to think about how, you know, some of the, the complexities in that case are really, um, directly handed down from, you know, Rancho, from the land grants language. And that's what's being litigated as, as the sort of early property rights still. Um, and I, I try to, you know, I have my opinions, but I try to create a fairly balanced 
look at the issues in the book, you know, whether it's Martin Beach or something else. Um, as to the, you know, the Coastal Commission boundaries, I wasn't really thinking about that a whole lot on my journey. Um, and, um, you know, I don't write about that at, at any real length in the book, actually. But uh, yeah, I mean, access is a, is a major issue. I, I run in, in Santa Cruz County, I ran into a, a, a landowner who, you know, sort of presents the, the, the landowner's perspective on that um, and rants and raves against the state parks. And yet uh, I sort of glowingly write about the state parks at other um, times in the book. So hopefully there's a sort of composite portrait of, of those contentious issues in the book. Um, if you read it from start to finish. So uh, this one, this question is about whether there were any problems you encountered that surprised you that would have also been encountered by these travelers in the past for which there were and still are no perfect solutions. That's a good, that's a good question. I mean, they ran up against things like the seaside mountains, which I mentioned, or sometimes they'd have to carry firewood, uh, you know, in the vicinity of Half Moon Bay, for example, um, that the, those, uh, the half, the, the coast range there was remarkably free of trees, uh, even then as it is now. So they were carrying, uh, firewood for a few days, uh, north towards Pacifica. Um, you know, they've, uh, they've issues of, you know, finding a water source occasion, occasionally. My issues, of course, were wildly different. I wasn't veering around seaside mountains, but instead I was veering around military installations. Uh, you know, sometimes a detours of many days to do that. So I did, I did um, so secure a guide to go into Camp Pendleton briefly, which is my one entrance into a military base in California. Um, and then, of course, I, I, you know, I, I was confined to roads at times, and those are dangerous. And uh, I tried not to think about it for the most part, about cars whizzing by me. Um, and then, um, uh, shoot, I lost my train of thought, but uh, yeah, oh, the well, private property, that's, you know, the last thing. I, I right. did make some decisions to, to, to hop gates or uh, cut across big ranches. I walked the train tracks through the Hollister Ranch and Coho Halama Ranches, um, figuring my odds of being detained by Union Pacific were less than the, the, the ranch guards. Um, and I felt important, you know, in those, I didn't feel like I could uh, call the military's bluff, but I did feel like I could sneak through some big ranches. And so that's, that's what I did. And I hope I, I justified it thinking that there was a public service to this book and to showing, you know, how difficult it is to do this transect now. Right. Okay, Felicity, why don't you get one last question in here and then we will uh, let Nick go. Okay, then I'll just make it back to the subject of the people you were uh, you met and and encountered. Who, what type of person or what individual understood your mission best, and why? Um, you know, I did. Uh, that's an interesting question. You know, when usually I didn't, I didn't, I would share what I was up to. Um, some people were curious about it, but most people, you know, I was I was after their stories, so. My goal was to, you know, get get them talking. Um, but yeah, I mean, most people just couldn't imagine walking as far as I was trying to walk, um, <laughs> and that was sort of eye opening. And and almost no one had heard of the Bartola expedition. Um, even even you know the the people who you know you might think the highly educated the people who had you know graduate degrees or whatever it might be. Um, uh, you had never heard of the Patrol Expedition, and, and that was in some ways really validating for what I this, this is a history that had never been written. Why, why is there no book that, you know, it took till 2016 for someone to, to retrace the foundational expedition in California? You know, the East Coast didn't let that happen to their history. Um, so I, I, I felt, you know, I don't know if that, that, that answers the question obliquely, but um, well, remember, remember that the West Coast is full of people that grew up on the East Coast. So, a, it explains their ignorance, and b, their indifference to the question. I guess. <laughs> yeah. So, well, look. Um, only one what, more question, Bruce. If, if okay. I could. And uh, that's just what at the at the end of it all gave you the most joy. 
Uh, you know, every every day was a joy. Just the the sort of minor details. I think I'm I'm pretty detailed, image oriented, and um, naming the flora and fauna. Um, seeing uh, you know seeing these landscapes uh, for the first time, really. I mean, I grew up in Northern California and hadn't spent much time at all in Southern California. So it was a new trip for me, just as it was for them. It was it was unexplored for me personally, and. Um, it was a, an amazing way to truly get to know California, and I, I'll you know always be thankful for the experience. So, um, first of all, we'll thank Felicity for asking excellent questions, and you, uh, Nick for the wonderful job you did answering them. Uh, let's show the book once more time and remind people that the paperback is out today. So, uh, a little money savings there. <laughs> uh, you can also you can also download it online, uh, which I do. I don't read regular books anymore. I read everything online because I've been hanging around with undergraduates so long. So you can get it that way too. Um, and uh, he's working on a new book, which do you have a title for it yet? Or are you still working on that? I'm still working on it, but it's about a newly designated discovered species of finch in a remote isolated mountain range in Idaho that's going to go extinct due to climate change. So it's about the discovery and the amazing ecology of this bird and then its disappearance at, at our hands as well. Um, All right. Eventual well, disappearance. Well, we look forward to that and we thank you very much. Uh, I think our time is pretty much up. It's uh, right at uh, 3.30, 3.29. So uh, thank you very much for this uh, really wonderful presentation. And uh, for those in the audience, we hope to have a few more events this summer. Uh, so uh, keep, uh, we will send out notifications of that. So thank you again, Nick. And thank you very everybody much. Else. Thank you, Felicity. And thank you, Marco. And thank you, everyone, for, for watching. And um, I, I hope you get out and about in California and, and stay safe while doing it. Okay, very good. We'll end on that. Thank you very much. Okay, cheers. Take care.